So, little story. Just pretend is the first stage that I gave you $1,000. Woo! You have $1,000 more than you have before. And now you have two choices. You could either, again, flip that coin, and if the coin comes up heads, get another $1,000, and if the coin comes up tails, get zero. Or I could just give you another $500, okay? Who wants the first one? Who wants the second one? I may have counted a little bit wrong, but not so wrong that we can't draw the conclusion that most of you wanted the $500 for sure versus the gamble. That's not surprising because that is consistent with risk averse behavior. And that, you know, that is consistent with what we think people, you know, people, most people are risk averse most of the time. You guys aren't weird yet. Okay. Totally fine. So, second poll question. Now say up front I gave you $2,000. I'm feeling particularly generous today. So just say here, have $2,000. Now you have two options. The first option, I flip a coin. If the coin comes up heads, I take $1,000 away from you. If the coin comes up tails, I don't take anything away from you. Second option, I just take $500 from you. Raise your hand if you want the first option. Raise your hand if you want the second option. You guys are actually more abnormal than any class I've had before. <laughs> and I don't, that doesn't mean irrational, you know, that doesn't mean irrational, that literally means abnormal. Because here, we're not seeing that much difference, right? The first one was 8 and 22, and this one's 10 and 18. That we're still seeing that people are, by and large, favoring this certain outcome versus the gamble. But we can think about what happens more generally. Now this is what's reported in the original prospect theory paper. So one thing the paper starts off by doing is just pulling people and say, which one of these sounds better? Which one of these do you, do you want? And then reporting the results to show some motivation for why we have to be thinking about a different model than we were using for this expected utility model. Mm -hmm. I think this is messed up though, because I saw the first question first, and then the second one right after it. I bet when they did this, they didn't show them right after. They weren't even the same people. Yeah. Um, because, yeah. That usually when you do things like this, because there is what you would consider in psychology sort of like a priming effect mm -hmm. or something like that, it's actually really difficult to ask the same group of people multiple questions. Because they start, you know, the more questions you're asked, the more you start thinking about what the, the researcher is trying to get at, right? Like, what's the trick? What are they trying to do? What's the manipulation? There are two ways of getting around that a little bit. One of them is to just utilize randomization and just say, I have a pool of, let's say, 100 experimental subjects. I'm going to randomize and put 50 in one group and 50 in the other group. Ask the first question to this group. Ask the second question to this group. If you're randomizing people into groups, there should not be any systematic differences between the groups. It just kind of gives you a little bit of noise. It doesn't give you as clean a comparison because you don't have a literal within subject comparison. You only have the between subject comparison. The other thing that researchers do when they really feel like they want that within subject comparison is they would still randomize into 50 and 50. They would give one of the groups the first question, then the second question give the other group the second question and the first question, so you could at least see how much it matters. So that's a way, yeah, you, you wouldn't necessarily, from an experimental design sense, want to be asking the same group two so questions and not... Right next to each other, like, well, this is the same question, just off the chin. Off you the would. Line. Like I said, even this class is abnormal. The other classes even when asked these two questions in sequence, showed more marked flips in their preferences. So I guess what I'm saying is what seems obvious to you is not obvious to everyone. And we're gonna, we're gonna see some things that are like that. And one of the things that, you know, even when you know, I was sitting in your shoes, I was the student, I had one professor that would repeat all the time you need to remember that you're not necessarily representative. 
Because if you think about the overall distribution of people, the average person hasn't studied economics, the average person you know, hasn't even necessarily gone to college, and so on and so forth. And if we're trying to describe general human behavior, extrapolating from our own experiences sometimes works. You know, like I said last time, you get into this world of, yep, I do that, yep, I do that. But it doesn't always work, just because you're not a representative population. You had a question? You answered my question. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah. Yeah. I, actually, I I wonder because uh, all the people in in this experiment they do they won't actually lose anything. So maybe it is not very worthy uh, related to the reality. I think. Yeah. So you guys would make very good experimental researchers because even just in this five minutes, you brought up a lot of issues that researchers are actually very careful to, you know, to keep in mind to try to correct for, etc. So the issue here was, well, if you ask people hypothetical questions, are they necessarily going to act as they would actually act? That answer is, we don't know. Maybe sometimes we can't guarantee it. Experimental research and getting published in 1979 was way easier than getting published today. <laughs> because you're starting from a blank slate, and you're like, dude, anything's better than nothing. You want to ask people hypothetical questions? We've, we, we're starting with nothing. Sure, that's awesome. Now, except in very specific circumstances, that would not fly because of exactly that issue. Like, how do you know that people, when asked hypothetical questions, will answer as they would actually behave? There's even an extension of that when doing laboratory experiments how can you be sure that in the laboratory they're going to behave in the same way they would, you know, behave more generally when they didn't have such a target in question, when you didn't have their full attention, etc. So there are arguments even to be made between laboratory experiments and field experiments. And so the, the bar has definitely been raised. You wouldn't just be able to do this unless it really was a starting point to say, is this even worth looking at further? And so most of the experiments that we look at will actually involve people getting money as payouts. So we try to make it as real as possible. Sometimes that gets weird. Sometimes that involves going to developing countries so your research budget goes further, frankly. That you're trying to give people that are like significant stakes, if you go places where the cost of living is a lot lower, then you can make them feel like they're dealing with more significant stakes than you could if you use a population in the US. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a, an taking cultural biases for that? Yeah so, yeah, so what you would see is you would never be quite sure because you wouldn't be able to disentangle. Maybe people are behaving differently because of cultural differences. Maybe people are behaving differently because of the scale of the wins and losses that we're presenting to them. But it can still give us an idea of, is this something worth pursuing further? You know, does the initial indication seem like the effect is consistent or not? Should we expand this? Should we ask for more research dollars? It's sort of a, an iterative, incremental process, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think also, like, if the people that answered, for example, like I answered also, like, I would want to get the riskier option. Some people maybe, once it gets down to that, act on, like, where they actually have to give money, they probably maybe would take the safer option. Right. That we can say, you know, when asked the hypothetical question, we can't guarantee that people aren't responding in the way that they would want themselves to respond. You know, if, you're, if I were going to ask you, for example, are you going to go home and do all your homework tonight, you might say yes. Because that's like, the person you want to be would say yes, would actually do their homework tonight. But we're not always the people that we want to be. And that's sort of the crux of behavioral economics in the first place. So we get into this like meta problem, right? Um, so, yeah, it becomes hard, and we have to keep thinking about within reasonable budgetary constraints, how can we give people something that's a real task, a real choice, something that's meaningful to get a more accurate read on behavior. And as time goes on, as we're getting more and more research, that bar is getting higher because we've already done the things that are sort of easier or more rudimentary. Yeah. And we'll see... Even one of the papers that we're going to talk about, I think on Thursday, they had to stretch their research budget and they couldn't pay people for each trial 
And what they had to do was say, you better answer truthfully. You better answer how you're actually going to want to behave because after we've done all this, we're going to choose one of the trials to make real. But they didn't explicitly make all four of the trials real because they didn't have budget for it. But they could at least approximate that and say, hey, there's a chance that everything you do will have consequences, which is sort of a way of leveraging and hoping that people take it seriously when there's some probability that it will be real ex post. So yeah, we lots of fun stuff that we think about here because experiments aren't always as easy as they seem on the surface. Yeah, yeah and we look here, people are flipping a lot more than you did, right? That when we had this situation framed as gains, again, we have the typical risk-averse behavior. This is not surprising, right? That most people want a certain outcome. And then when we have the same thing framed as losses, we somehow convinced people that they wanted a gamble rather, rather than a sure thing, right? And as some of you have noted, we're like, well, wait a minute. This doesn't actually make any sense because if we're thinking about this in terms of our typical expected utility model, these are exactly the same thing. You know, we talked about one of the assumptions of economic rationality was that people are not susceptible to framing manipulations. What we did here was just a framing manipulation. That between the second choice that you were asked about and the first choice that you were asked about, if you thought about this in terms of final states of wealth, the two questions were the same. But some of you did change your answers. Let's put this into this traditional risky choice model and see what happens. We've got our level of wealth and we've got some utility from that. And we have people that, given the common answer to the first framing of the question, are likely risk averse individuals. So we can use our utility function like this. If we were to think about this in terms of final outcomes, final states of wealth, if I were to say I'm giving you $1,000 and then I'm giving you $500 more, in total I've given you $1,500, you also had some existing level of wealth, just call it W. So that certain outcome in the first case left you with just W plus $1,500. Now, if we were to think about this risky outcome, if you chose the risky outcome and you lost the gamble, you got $1,000 up front and then zero, leaving you with the final wealth level of W plus 1,000. Here, I guess by the scale of the graph, I'm implicitly assuming your existing wealth level is not very high. No offense. If you chose the gamble and won the gamble, I gave you the $1,000 up front and then another $1,000, your final level of wealth would then be W plus 2,000. We could do the same thing that we did before and say we've got the utility of W plus 1,500, we've got the utility of W plus 1,000, and we've got the utility of W plus 2,000. And again, the expected utility is the point on this line segment between the two possible outcomes that corresponds to the expected value. So not surprising that most of you picked the $500 for sure. That's completely consistent with what we've already done. The problem is, now consider that second question that you were given. I said, now you were given $2,000 up front. If you then took the certain outcome with that question, I took $500 from you. So all told, I gave you $2,000 and took away $500. Your final level of wealth is W plus $1,500. If you took the gamble, I gave you $2,000. This time, if you won the gamble, I took away zero, leaving you with W plus $2,000. If you lost the gamble, I gave you 2,000, took back 1,000, your final level of wealth 
is w plus 1,000. We can see if we're using our expected utility model to model these two questions, it's completely impossible for us to explain the behavior that we're seeing from people. Because this model unambiguously says if you prefer the certain outcome in the first framing, you prefer the certain outcome in the second framing, and vice versa. You know, even if we did this as a risk neutral person, if we did this as a risk loving person, it would change their preference. But in no case would it account for the switch in preference. And that's the, you know, that's the crux of irrationality. And that's one of the things that's important to keep in mind, that irrationality doesn't mean I think you did something stupid or I don't agree with your choice. Irrationality, in a lot of ways, shows a specific inconsistency or a specific bias to say, you know, regardless of how you answered the first question, there's no wrong answer to the first question, just your preferences. There's no way from just asking one of these questions, I could categorize you as rational or irrational. The only way I can categorize you as irrational is if I change something that doesn't matter and you change your answer. That it's that inconsistency that we're looking to document, not judge people's choices on a one-by-one -one basis. And that's an important distinction. Because you hear, especially if you're like, you're reading something in the news or you know, reading some sort of op-ed, people like to use the term irrational behavior very loosely. That you know, people will say, oh, somebody took out a payday loan. Think about how high the interest is on that loan. That's a totally irrational thing to do. And by the definition of irrationality that we use here, we couldn't actually conclude that because that decision, even though it's not one that we would necessarily make, that decision is one that could be consistent with some reasonably well-defined utility curves and so on and so forth. 